and welcome to the Blockchain and Us, where pioneers and thought leaders talk about their journey in blockchain technology, crypto assets, and the token economy. And I'm your host, Manuel Staggers. This episode has support from my very own The Blockchain and Us newsletter. Get an email from me every two weeks with a very short summary of new podcast episodes so you can immediately pick those interviews you'd like to listen to. To stay up to date, just visit www.theblockchainandus.com and sign up today. My guest today is Jason Goldberg. Jason is the founder and CEO of Open Simple Token OST and a veteran internet entrepreneur with a long history of scaling products to millions of users. He started his career in technology at AOL in 2001 and has launched and sold several tech companies. Since 2016, Jason's passion has been to drive mainstream consumer adoption of blockchain technologies. And now to the conversation with Jason Goldberg. Hi, Jason, and many thanks for taking time today. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate it. And I'm uh, really excited to talk about uh, blockchain and OST and all things entrepreneurship. Let's jump right in with OST. Can you first briefly explain what your vision is with the project? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, we, we really look at OST as, as uh, trying to be the, uh, the essential tools for forward-thinking companies to, you know, to build uh, new economies. Um, and you know, we look at that um, while a lot of folks have looked at blockchain as an entire kind of new uh, kind of you know, ecosystem and an entirely new uh, kind of new, new dApps, decentralized applications kind of building from scratch, we looked out at the market uh, starting a couple of years ago and we thought that there was a great opportunity to help existing companies with tens of millions of users uh, leverage blockchain and leverage decentralization technologies. Uh, to help improve their position and to provide better customer experiences and end user experiences. Um, and ultimately, we think that you know, blockchain will be a transformative technology and that'll be a blend of Web 2.0 companies uh, kind of bridging to Web 3 and kind of entirely new businesses beginning as Web 3, 3 projects. Uh, and we're just you know, really excited to be kind of you know, providing tools that help you know, build that bridge and also to help uh, blockchain enable businesses. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, I've seen you mention it many times in, in several talks, uh, the difficulty of adoption of blockchain technology in, especially in consumer apps. So why, why is that so difficult? Well, I think it's just still early days is, is really what it is. And, um, I mean, we're talking about, you know, you know, a complete paradigm shift from entirely centralized, uh, businesses where, uh, you know, the norm uh, since, you know, for, you know, for decades has been that, uh, you know, you have these you know, large companies that control everything um, and they control all user data. They control, um, you know, kind of the economics and the value creation within every you know, kind of community. Uh, and, you know, blockchain has the potential, it's not, not yet achieved, but has the potential to disrupt that uh, and to uh, push the value uh, kind of realization uh, closer to the value creation. Uh, and so to enable, you know, the individuals, uh, and entities who are creating value in communities and systems to uh, capture more of that value and to enable you know, more seamless you know, transactions and transfers. Um, we go into a number of different you know, benefits, um, but all of that is still very, very early. I mean, I, I kind of, when someone asks, you know, says to me, you know, where is all the, the blockchain usage? Um, and I kind of say, you know, kind of, you know, replace the word blockchain with the word internet in 1995. Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of, I think where we're at is that you, you know, there's an order to these two kind of, you know, adoption curves. And, uh, you know, you, you first you have infrastructure and then scalability uh, and then comes usability and then comes adoption. Uh, and these things happen in a certain order for a reason. Like there's no, there's no reason to build elegant user experiences until you have, app, you know, kind of the infrastructure that in place that will scale. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so you, you, and then you don't, you're not going to have apps take off and to have you know, really elegant, uh, user experiences. And, you know, I think the, the, the aspect of, you know, blockchain and, and, you know, being tied to, you know, to crypto, um, and the fact that there is a, you know, a market price that everyone is seeing, you know, by the second, by the minute every day for cryptocurrencies, um, has just created a dynamic in the kind of technology adoption cycle where, the hype, you know, way exceeded the reality uh, way too fast, and the expectations of uh, people who looked at 
crypto as investors, not crypto as enabling technology, uh, is um, you know was blown way out of kind of out of scale and out of proportion. Um, and, and you know it's 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 still early days. And I you know I, I'm a huge believer in the long term potential of the technology. And that's a set up front. You know I think that the technology, you know, blockchain technology, will um, permeate various parts of business. Um, and it's not an either or. I think there'll be some businesses that stay entirely centralized. There'll be some businesses that uh, you know, adopt you know, increasingly decentralization principles on behalf of providing better experiences to their users. And then there'll be new businesses and projects that you know, come about that are entirely decentralized. Um, and I think all that's going to happen. And it's just a matter of time. And it's a matter of you know, developing the first few kind of mass market uh, use cases. Mm -hmm. What role does the blockchain hype and and also the um, you know the anti hype where you have a market crash like currently? What what kind of role do these market conditions play in the adoption of the technology? You know, a few things kind of mention this. I think um, a lot of because of all the hype and all the the money in uh, in 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 blockchain and crypto over the last you know, you know, year or two years, um, I think that you know, even a lot of the projects, unfortunately, got caught up in it. And um, they started selling these big dreams and visions of uh, delivering products that you know, would get, you know, gain you know, tens of millions of users much faster than was ever realistic. And I'm very proud you know, that we, we haven't been, you know, we, we are a project that have not done that. We've been saying all along that this is going to take time. And we have a very focused strategy, which I'll walk through in a minute. And we've been following it like point by point by point. Um, but I think what a lot of the, the dApps, the centralized applications, um, and the people who've been supporting dApps forgot, which is, you know, it's like a kind of a first principle of any kind of, you know, growing any business these days, especially in an online business, is that, uh, you know, you can't just build product and assume that you're going to gain an audience, that uh, distribution is, is part of the product. Uh, you know, Reid Hoffman, you know, founder of LinkedIn, um, you know, in my mind, one of the best product managers, uh, you know, technology visionaries of our time. Um, you know, he's always he's always said that you know that, that the first product priority is distribution uh, and then features um, because there's no sense in building features unless you have people to build them for. Mm, uh, good point. And and that's something that I really uh, ascribe to and um, really believe in. It's it's really fueled kind of our go to market strategy for OST. Uh, but I think um, industry forgot that, and so you see that. People launch these, and you know, people launch these DApps, and no one uses them. And it's like, you know, there's no sense to build technology for technology's sake, or you know, build technology in search of a user. Um, you know, any anybody who's been around entrepreneurship, been around product management, um, will tell you that you know, you know, you have to figure out what what problem are you solving with your product, and build build out from there versus the other way around. Yeah. I mean, it seems sometimes in, in many of these projects, the main problem is that there's a huge stash of cash. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. then that's the problem you're solving. You just have yeah. to ship something. Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, we, we started, you know, the, the, this you know, OST that was originally called Simple Token. OST stands for Open Simple Token. You know, we started working on the, the ideas of this in early 2016. In 2017, we, you know, in early 2017, we, refine the technology uh, kind of roadmap and plan and kind of, mm -hmm. and we started with a go to market strategy, not with, with the technology strategy. And they, we, we built the technology strategy around our plan to go to market. And so, you know, think you know, we've been at this, you know, three full years now. Um, and uh, which I think is, you know, it's like we're, you know, we're, we're like, you know, old veterans in the blockchain space. Right? And we haven't veered from our strategy. And I think our, I'd say that there's two counter theses that we had um, at, that, at the beginning of uh, you know, forming Simple Token uh, OST that we still hold true today, and I think they've really held well for us. Um, but they were, you know, for a long time you know, during the hype, real you know, kind of hype, everyone thought that we were, you know, they thought we were kind of crazy. They were kind of like, we were kind of the, the anti-narrative. Um, and sometimes it's the anti-narratives that are the, the, you know, were the ones you should look closer at. Um, so, you know, the first kind of, uh, kind of you know, anti-narrative that we had um, was, you know, everyone was talking about, well, everything's going to be tokenized. Everyone's going to do an ICO. Mm -hmm. Everyone's just going to build their own ERC-20 token. And, um, and we looked out at the market and said, you know, this is crazy. That, you know, 
99.99% of companies are not going to do their own ICO. They're not going to want the legal regulatory headache involved in doing so. Um, they're not going to want to, uh, you know, mint their own tokens, which meaning they'd have to you know, hire uh, blockchain developers and uh, you know cobble together various protocols um, and uh, you know and build everything themselves. Uh, and and we just thought it was unrealistic that. Um, this notion that everyone's just going to, to ICO. And we really, and then we also saw this kind of, you know, the, we predicted the, the regulatory climate was not going to support, uh, you know, people doing ICOs that are really just selling securities and not proving utility first and uh, not taking precautions to, around, you know, never promising, uh, you know, anything around investment or return investment. And we saw everyone doing this stuff. And we saw, and we saw that, you know, that, and especially, I'd say, you know, summer 2017 and then especially in 2018, we saw, you know, massive ICOs where, you know, really just kind of ignoring, you know, reasonable, you know, kind of or conservative principles around, you know, avoiding, uh, you know, decades of securities laws. Right. Uh, and we're kind of and and so we kind of said, like, this this is a very, very short window where, um, you know, that that everyone's going to be, you know, Think, can think they can do their own ICO and see this kind of free money. We saw that, well, this is going to tighten. And what we were, you know, we said what we're going to build is um, the tools that businesses need. If there's a reason for them to have a token, so a branded currency, um, that would function more like a stored value inside of their application, um, to, uh, that we would provide the tools uh, to enable them to do that. Um, just like companies have used tools, whether it's AWS for hosting or uh, Salesforce for CRM or Twilio for messaging. It's a good analogy, yeah. Technology stack to enable businesses um, you know, to do this. And, and a lot of folks said, well, why do I need, you need tools? They're just going to you know, create an ERC-20 token. And we're like, come on. It's like you could say, you know, why doesn't everyone just build their own, you know, their own CRM or build their own messaging? Or you know, it, 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 companies always use tools to not have to build everything themselves. And so... That was, so we developed kind of a kind of a full stack approach to um, you know how do we enable you know, companies to launch their own uh, branded currencies without the legal regulatory headaches involved um, and without building the technology themselves. Yeah, this, that's it. The second kind of counter narrative that we had was the other thing that developed at the same time was everyone in the industry you know over the last couple of years was running immediately to dApps. Like everything was, well, you know, it, it, you know, dApps are going to take over the world and, you know, distributed applications are the only thing that we should, you know, focus on. And, you know, why would anyone want a centralized application anymore? And um, so, you know, everything in the entire industry was around the vision of dApps and, uh, you know, so building, building tools for dApps, protocols for dApps and, and dApps themselves. Um, and our thesis was, you know, as I said, dApps are interesting, but they're going to take many years to materialize. And in the meantime, you know, we, we said from the very beginning, let's focus on where the, the users are, distribution is. And um, we said, let, let's focus on mainstream applications, mainstream businesses, you know, with, with existing user bases, with, you know, millions of, or tens of millions or even hundreds of millions of users who want to be giraffes. They want to stick their neck out and they want to try a new technology and figure out, can it provide a better user experience and give them a competitive advantage in the marketplace and build more trust with their users. Um, and we said, let's build for them. Uh, and I tell you, like, I really feel like for a long time, we were the only people in the industry even looking at that. And, you know, I would talk to, you know, kind of crypto investors and they're like, you're doing what? Like, why aren't you just building for the dApps? And, and then, you know, why, why don't they just use your protocol? And why are you building, like, we, you know, we have SaaS dashboards and APIs and SDKs and, like, why do you need this? Why don't they just take what you're, what's in your GitHub and run with it? And I was like, because that's not how companies work. <laughs> and you know, it's like, and so, you know, we give, you know, large company X who has, you know, 10 million or 100 million users, the ability for, you know, their developers to easily, you know, integrate, test, pilot, um, a branded, you know, token within their, within their app without having to write a single line of blockchain code. And we give them all the tools they need to manage and analyze uh, how their economy is working. Uh, and I, I, I if there's, you know, these two things combined is, you know, the, the, um, the entire reason why I'm sitting, you know, one of the guys right now is sitting, um, you know, humble yet confident about our position. I, I really believe that we are set up for incredible 
success in 2019. Mm -hmm. I mean, you said a lot of things I wanted to bring out in in future questions. Um, But I think this is a really good summary and and sums up your position and and even part of your strategy very well, even though I'll I'd like to ask a few more things about the strategy later, but maybe let's start first with, you mentioned before LinkedIn, right? Or you mentioned a consumer app with perhaps, you know, tens of or hundreds of millions of users like like WhatsApp, for example. I mean, first of all, why would they want to tokenize their app? Yeah, so I I think, and I think, you know, any business that is innovative is always looking at kind of what's on the next frontier and seeing, you know, what's coming around the corner and how do they, um, build competitive advantage in the marketplace. And uh, what, what a lot of businesses are realizing with blockchain um, is that uh, you know, blockchain uh, and tokenization uh, can enable them to build uh, a few things. Uh, one is you know, increased loyalty. Um, so having a branded currency that could be used for rewarding and incentivizing uh, user behaviors. Um, yeah, okay, but let's say, let's say your WhatsApp, I mean, you already have the trust of people and they're, they're locked in, right? So, I mean, why would they well, still... Well, I, 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 rather than taking WhatsApp as a specific app, because I, I haven't necessarily, you know, I'll think in a second as to why WhatsApp might have, might want to token. I haven't really thought of that, but just think more, more broadly. Mm-hmm. Um, but so, uh, so, so that's one. And then I think there's, you know, under, underarching this is the notion that, um, you know, if you go from kind of central database to public blockchain, um, you create a layer of transparency and openness and trust with your users. Uh, and uh, I think you, what we have found is that um, not every business is you know, ready to buy into that, but, every, but, but most uh, forward-thinking, uh, innovative businesses, they see that this is coming. And uh, the ones that we're working with, they say, well, we don't want to be the ones who are kind of you know, disrupted by a competitor who figures this out. We want to be the ones who are out ahead and, and trying to figure it out. And that's why, you know, we find that, um, you know, the companies we're working with, you know, they're looking at, you know, how do they use a branded currency to, you know, to build loyalty, to, to incentivize user behavior, to facilitate more seamless cross-border transactions, to have a common currency kind of within their application uh, to, uh, provide openness and trust to their users uh, to provide new ways to uh, you know to give value or reward to, give rewards to the people who are creating the value in their ecosystems to turn like their ecosystem into an economy uh, and those are things that you just can't do you know with fiat currency I mean if you uh, for instance you know if you were to reward uh, everyone who you know liked or upvoted or, you know within an app. Um, you, know, you can't send people, you know, kind of a cent or a fraction of a cent at a time, um, but you can do quite easily, uh, you know, with tokens. Um, and uh, and so, so look, you know, we have you know a, a wide range of examples um, in terms of our partner companies that we're looking to bring to market next year. One that I'll point out is a company called Hornet, uh, which is working uh, with the LGBT Foundation, uh, and they're going to be one of the first. Uh, companies to launch uh, with us uh, early next year. And that's a social network? Yeah, so Hornet is a social network for the gay and lesbian community. Uh, They have about 30 million uh, active users, about 5 million monthly uh, kind of recurring right now. Um, And what they're looking at is they already have a kind of strong cohort of power users. Uh, And they're looking at starting with those power users and looking at uh, can they reward the power users for helping uh, the community with certain actions. Um, so whether those actions are uh, bug testing or spam reporting or writing articles, contributing content, um, and then then provide ways for the people who are earning those LGBT tokens to first spend them with inside of Hornet. Um, so for uh, whether it's you know subscriptions or um, other kind of uh, kind of you know, features within within the app, and then the next step is looking at how they actually can then spend them with Hornet's partners. Um, and then it goes from those partners then could have a decision whether they want to, uh, you know, you know, either cash out what they perceive or, or spend it back on apps like Hornet or others um, for advertising or promotion. Um, so creating a full cycle kind of economy there. Um, and that's a real example. And it's one where, uh, you know, we've been you know, meeting with, with their team. You know, every week we have um, a workshop and a project plan, and you know we're gearing up to launch this uh, in 
you know, in, in, in early, you know, 2019, you know, the timetable is you know, kind of an early Q2 and, um, and that's, you know, that's, it's very real. And, uh, and, and when it launches, you know, it will all, you know, over, it'll already be by far larger than any you know, DAP that's out there. And because they have the install base of users and they have people who are already kind of, you know, playing these roles. Um, now we got to go do it. We got to, you know, and, you know, we're, 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 we've, we've been building all the, the infrastructure and the tools to enable you know, apps like Hornet to to be successful with this and enable the LGBT token to be successful, and that's not easy stuff. It's very very uh, you know, there's still a lot of you know, a lot of details, and you got to solve very hard problems, such as you know we've built a layer two scaling solution on Ethereum. Um, we've built uh, easy way to for um, for companies like you know Hornet to write smart contracts without writing any Solidity code on their side. To, you know, to end user wallets that are user friendly that don't require um, what people think about today in terms of like a metamask type you know kind of experience and mm-hmm. so really hard problem in solving around both the uh, scalability and usability of blockchain and we're you know really excited to bring that to market and you know Hornet's just one example right so OSD's you know client partners um, they depending how you count them they have you know more than 300 million or 400 million monthly active users you know, between them uh, and 2019 is when we're bringing them to market and uh, you know, one of one of the apps that, that we work with, Unsplash. Mm-hmm. Um, they, you know, Unsplash has about ten billion billion photo views per month, uh, one point two billion API calls. They're the embedded photo image search on apps like Medium and Trello and Squarespace. Mm-hmm. And you know, looking at tokenizing that is not something that you just say. You know, you you can't just flip a switch. I mean, that's like you really carefully. <laughs> it's not done um, in an afternoon. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But 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 again, these are you know these are potentially you know kind of game changing uh, moments. And I, I kind of look back. So if you put in like in, this, in the scheme of things where we're at in terms of the crypto life cycle and the hype cycle, I kind of say you know the 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 market downturn is a great thing. It's going to focus on quality. Um, it's going to get a lot of the the scams. The um, I, yeah, there's some people who are just playing scams. There's also people who they're kind of like project scam. They're not like intentionally scamming. They're more just, they have a vision that they have no way to execute on. Mm. Uh, and it's just kind of remove a lot of the noise. I mean, if there was a while, uh, you know, you know, a few, you know, few months ago, I'd say like over the summer or earlier in the, in the year where, you know, you, you talk to some people in blockchain and they were, it was impossible for them to tell any of the projects apart because they all kind of, it's just a blockchain thing, right? <laughs> and mm. we need all that noise right. to go away. And it's time if, if 2018, you know, was the, the let's say if 2017 was the hype, 2018 was the bust. 2019's got to be the put up or shut up. Uh, and and but even in 2019, I don't look. I think I think we're going to show some really interesting results. But I would also caution that you know 2019's I think is going to be the start of proving um, real use cases, and that you know more like 2020s are more realistic, where we see kind of the first kind of you know, kind of. Uh, mainstream or mass market kind of lift off, uh, but you know we could be proven wrong. Who knows? But the I, I think you know, the, the industry is waiting for its hotmail moment. I don't know if you recall, but um, hotmail was the first really viral mainstream use of the internet, um, and uh, you know people were surfing around web pages that were slow to load and kind of just learning that there's information online, and then suddenly everyone had a hotmail account. Um, and the, and, and so blockchain is waiting for one of those moments. And once we have one, we'll have another and another and another. And some of them I think will come from predictable places. Uh, and some of them will be totally unexpected. And, but once those start to, to emerge, this whole thing will take on a whole new life. Mm-hmm. Cool. I mean, do you think one of your projects that you just mentioned, Hornet and Unsplash could be a, a hotmail? I think so. Yeah. And I think there's others that we're working with that we have not announced that, um, as well. Um, and again, you know, forward thinking companies who we call them giraffes, who you know, kind of want to stick their neck out and, you know, try things, uh, and see, you know, what sticks and try to see if they can deliver better user experiences, um, that some of those can hit. And if you have 10 million or a hundred million users and something hits, it'll really hit. Hmm. Okay. Fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> Jason, um, you've been in tech for almost 20 years. And uh, I mean, when, when did you fir- take your first job in tech? Well, I mean, generally, I, I remember the first time I you know, used uh, a web browser was the Mosaic 
uh, web browser. I mean, I used to like, you know, Gopher and kind of you know, Telnet in college, but I remember I was working at the White House um, from 1993 to 1998. And I remember it was somewhere in 1994, uh, 1995, where I, I used the you know, Mosaic browser and I was like, wow. And that was with a guy named Tom Khalil, who was uh, running kind of a technology office at the White House. And um, we just knew that there, were, there was, this was something. Um, uh, I went to Stanford Business School in 1998 and um, was really immersed in the Valley during the dot-com boom. Worked for a couple of uh, you know internet startups at the time there. Um, worked for a B2B company that was way too early but had a great idea called uh, Metium. Uh, and then I did you know I worked at AOL for a couple of years. Right. Um, and AOL with into dial-up times. Yeah, I mean AOL in 1999. I. I presented a, um, uh, I remember I presented a deck that no one at AOL wanted to listen to. It basically said, this business is going to go away if we don't figure out broadband. Um, and I was like, no, we have a great business. <laughs> um, you know, so it's hard for, it's hard for companies to reinvent themselves. You just mentioned there with AOL, right? That they didn't want to see that they will be disrupted at some point. And I mean, is that in your experience or in, in your view, is that somewhat similar to what's happening with blockchain technology today, where you have some of these big tech incumbents or otherwise, you know, maybe even financial firms who just do not want to see that at some point something new will come along and, and do away with their business model? Yeah. I mean, look, I was, I was with a, a very, you know, smart, well-respected venture capitalist a couple of weeks ago. And she was arguing to me that, uh, you know, why would a large company that has a reward system, a loyalty system, like a point system, want to put that on a blockchain because then they would be interoperable with other systems. Isn't it to their business advantage to stay closed? Uh, and I was like, wasn't it to AOL's advantage to stay closed as well? See how that worked, All right? I mean, AOL was the ultimate walled garden, right? Um, and I mean, yeah, like some companies will come kicking and screaming into the new world, but those who embrace it first will and figure out a way to use it to their advantage will gain huge spoils. Um, and you know, so we're working with another company, which we have not announced yet, who um, they have really figured out that if they have a points program, they've figured out that... Uh, so they have a loyalty program that's, you know, it's in a database right now. They figured out that if they move that to a blockchain, that they think that um, they're going to get a huge net gain from a kind of a trade kind of balance, um, that more people are going to want to move into them than out from them because they have a, you know, a low price point, high frequency. And so people who are earning, you know, say, you know, you know tokens or points elsewhere will want to bring them into, their, in, into them because they have more more frequent and more often kind of use of, 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 of points. And so they say, but the only way for us to get the, the, the benefit of that is we have to open up ourselves. Um, and so for us, it's like, you know, us, you know that, that's a perfect, you know, kind of a, a setup for us because, you know, we're providing the technology and the, kind of the interchange solution for all these various brand and token economies to, kind of, you know, to transact together. Well, and, and again, it's like, it's like, you know, I would say a, a completely different example in the airline industry, you know, I think, you know, there was a way, for instance, that airlines always operated. And then you had a company, Southwest Airlines, who came in in the U.S. and said, they, you know, they completely questioned the model. They said, you know, we're just going to provide friendlier, cheap, more cheerful customer service, and we're going to have um, a different kind of routing model and different way we treat our employees. And they're the most profitable airline in the world. And they, they, they figured out that providing a better customer experience um, and giving more value to the users uh, the, and the customers than to them could you know, could be a better business. And now, you know, and then everyone wanted to be Southwest Airlines. And you, and you see this example again and again and again. And I think, um, so it's like, you know, all it takes is a couple of these drafts to show that they've really, you know, moved some KPIs in a, in a meaningful way and everyone's going to jump in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and everybody wins, including the user for once <laughs> because yeah. they get a better product. I mean, I just wanted yeah. to ask, um, in your view, how will tokenization change the way we use software? You know, I... I think that it's a, it's a good question. I mean, I think that um, it's possible that uh, some software will run on tokens. Um, it's some, um, you know, it's, you know, so you can break down to more, um, you know, you have, you could have open source technology that uh, the user is more, you know, less interact, you know, less like buying from a company and more, uh, you know, 
paying into the ecosystem. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I obviously could help with kind of rent models, subscription models, staking models. Um, I need to think a little bit more though specifically about in terms of that, in terms of that though. Okay. You, you said before there will be entirely new services coming up, you know, next to just yeah. existing services that just have a better UX, but there will be entirely new things that maybe create incentives that previously weren't there. People will yeah. use new kinds of software. I mean, is there something on the horizon that you see already materializing maybe that, that is some kind of new thing that could come up in, in software? I mean, I guess I see more like the potential, but I'm also hesitant to like, I, I, I'm not one who just gets you know, really excited about look at the capabilities of this, this technology. It, it, it's more, um, let's start with the use case, mm-hmm. uh, then, you know, mold the technology to meet the use case. Uh, but I, I look, I think, you know, for instance, I, I'll just give this as a, an example. Um, and I have no idea who will create it and how it'll get done, but you know, Facebook is a, you know, one of the most, you know, uh, impressive, you know, targeted advertising, you know, kind of vehicles that's ever existed, right? Um, I mean, Facebook across all their properties, um, and you know, Google, you know, and between Google and Facebook, you have, you know, dominating like ninety percent of the world's you know, online advertising, um, and but yet, you know, the the um, while while obviously they capture a lot of data about us, um, you know, the data they they have is limited to your browsing history and kind of things you like and. Um, you know, they, they don't, you know, but now if, if someone anonymously could build a uh, kind of a system that users could, uh, opt into, uh, that is based on their token transfer history, um, mm-hmm. uh, that suddenly becomes a really interesting, uh, new way to kind of, to help advertisers or, um, you know, or, uh, you know, kind of commerce providers target. Uh, and reach consumers in a way that consumers want to be reached um, on more of an opt-in basis, but also having access to a lot more information uh, that's, you know, while it's anonymized, it can be more 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 useful at targeting to the user. Mm-hmm. Yeah, interesting. We already spoke about some of the technological hurdles to, to mass adoption um, at the beginning, but what other challenges do you see to, to mass adoption of blockchain technology? Um, I mean, I think the... I mean, I mean, scalability is a big one, um, you know, the, and uh, so, you know, I mean, look, people have an expectation that, uh, you know, by now, you know, people are carrying, you know, billions of people are carrying supercomputers in their phones that have you know, more powerful cameras than ever before. Um, and people expect, you know, instance gratification, they expect applications to run fast, they expect transactions to go through smoothly. Mm-hmm. And those are like table stakes that until blockchain can solve, you know, for that, um, you know, there's, you know, it, it, it's hard to imagine people kind of accepting a degraded experience just because it's more decentralized. And so I think this notion of, you know, to be like, well, you know, people will, you know, accept a, a lesser experience because they have more, you know, control over them, you know, over their own you know, usage. So I think, I think that's a very hard sell. Um, and so I think there's a lot that needs to happen on the, um, the usability of blockchain um, and the scalability and the throughput. Um, and there's a lot of great projects that are, you know, they're working on, on those things. And, um, but, uh, you know, you can't expect mass adoption until you are, are able to give an experience that's on par with uh, what people have, you know, have today and, uh, and then provides additional benefits that you, they can't get today. Mm. Yeah. And that's going to be super difficult, I think, because services like Facebook, Google, Apple are just super simple to use. And um, so there's a lot of catch up that you have to do if you're a new entrant there. Absolutely. So if you're an app that, you know, has an existing, say, you know, loyalty program today and um, and that program is, you know, a closed loop loyalty program where it's, you know, basically managed in a database. So the user doesn't really own their points. They have points that the company can always, you know, you know expire or change the value of and um, can only spend them back with the company. The company dictates how much they're worth. If that company moves their users to a blockchain-based you know, kind of program where the principle of, you know, you, you earned it, you own it. And if you don't like the offers we have, you can always spend it somewhere else. Um, that's a much better 
user value proposition. It's just about making sure that the experience of participating in that in that is deteriorated for what they have today. What, what do you think will happen to some of these tech giants? Look, I, I, I don't know any inside information. I can tell you that my expectation would be Microsoft focuses on the enterprise, Amazon focuses on the enterprise, Google takes a wait and see, and Facebook probably has a large number of people inside uh, Facebook trying to figure out how they figure something out in blockchain before someone else does, but then they end up probably buying a couple of companies also. Cool. I mean, Trent McConaughey, right? He introduced us and, yeah. and he said his, his view was that Facebook should just tokenize itself. Easier said than done. Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, it, 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 again, like going back to the example I had with, uh, you know, with my time at AOL is, you know, when you're talking to a business that's highly profitable, that has, you know, huge operations that are built a certain way and you go in and tell them, hey, you know, you need to change everything and go this other direction. You know, it's hard to gain an audience. And, you know, Facebook is a, you know, highly profitable business, you know, great, you know, great profit margins. You know, it's, 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 um, you know, the revenue growth is incredible. Uh, they've, uh, they've slowed down in terms of the user growth, but they're not overnight going to kind of change the entire business model. Now, do they try some things? Sure. They, uh, absolutely. I mean, they, they, they should, and I'm sure they will. Mm -hmm. yeah. In your work or in your life also, which people inspire you? Um, that's a great question. I mean, I think I'm, I'm definitely inspired by builders, um, you know, people who... Um, you know, defied the odds and, uh, you know, created uh, products and organizations and movements that, um, you know, that, that, uh, that's something I look up to. Um, my, my parents inspire me. Um, my colleagues inspire me. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm 46 years old and I feel I, I'm very humbled and privileged to, to get to do what I do every day and to, Uh, to work with, I mean, I've worked with a lot of people today who um, have worked with for many, many years. Um, my co-founder Sunil and I've worked together since 2008, uh, uh, you know, uninterrupted. And many of the people on the team uh, have been with the company uh, or or previous companies we've worked on for you know, four, five, six, seven years. Um, of our founding team, you know, Chris Dark and Renee Wong, I've been working with since 2012. Um, a lot of our investors, uh, you know, Tencent and Raycroft have been backing me for years and um, just very humbled by the people's belief in our ability to, to build things. When you got started in, in your career in tech, did you have any mentors or role models? Um, yeah, I mean, I've had lots of mentors in, in my career. I, I think, um, you know, there's... Um, uh, You know, I, I, you know, to point certain people out, uh, there was a guy, Jim Bankoff at AOL, who I thought you know, I really admired his, uh, his, his management style and his decision-making style. And he's very product-focused. It was always product-first with Jim. What, sorry to interrupt there. What was, what's maybe one takeaway from, that, from the first experience? You know, one thing that you'd say you learned from this particular mentor? I would say you know, product-first um, product uh, and, you know, you and that product needs to solve a problem for the, for the end user. Uh, that, um, uh, you know, you know, you can have all the vision in the world, but if you don't have the right product to meet their consumer needs at the right time, it doesn't come together. I mean, the reason I asked there for this takeaway is because I, I, I'll always remember there was one thing when I was about 20 years old, somebody told me, said, always finish everything. Yeah. Never leave anything just open, you know, just, even if just take 10 more minutes and just wrap it up yeah. in a form where you can present it. Yeah. I mean, I see, you know, my, my father... Um, you know, I remember a long time ago, you know, he instilled in me, you know, if, if, you know, back in school, it was, you know, if you think you've gotten enough done to get a B and you know what needs to get done to get an A, why not get it done? Um, and that was always kind of the, the attitude I've had is like, um, uh, attention to detail and the job's not finished until it's really done. Um, uh, yeah. and, and don't just settle, you know, don't just settle for okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. Definitely. How do you personally keep a balance between what you're working on in technology and in the blockchain space and yeah. the other aspects of your yeah. human existence? I mean, I, I would say a couple things there. So one is, um, I mean, you said, uh, you know, I was in tech and now in blockchain. To me, there's no difference. I'm just in tech. Uh, and I'm a builder and I like you know, building companies and bringing people together to solve problems together. And, um, you know, I'm, 
I'm fortunate that I get the opportunity to do that every day with you know a team of incredibly hardworking, dedicated uh, people who believe in our vision and are executing on our mission and um, you know on our strategy. And um, so that's just that in itself is the is is the reward of getting to do that every day. Um, we don't get caught up in the hype. We don't get caught up in you know I, I've been to one blockchain conference this year, uh, and that was by design. Um, we kind of said, let's keep our heads down that these things can be distracting and a lot of kind of, you know, when the, when the market was up, everyone thought they were the smartest people in the world. Um, and you know, there's a, you know, there's a definite comment is, you know, when the, when, when the stock's up 30%, don't, don't get to thinking you're brilliant because when it's down 30%, you don't want to just get thinking that you're stupid. Um, and you know, so we kind of look at it as that just keep your heads down and build. Um, and the, the ultimate measuring stick here is going to be do our customers our clients use the product that's it mm-hmm. uh, and if they do then we're proving success and if not the rest is just noise uh, you know it's like uh you know when when people ask me you know what should the price of lst be for instance uh, one is i say I don't comment on the price and i say and if that did i'd say it should be based on whatever the users of it, you know, kind of are willing to, because there is, it, it, it's not a speculative object. It's, it's, it's based on you know, what's needed. Um, so um, I'd say the other things is uh, I, I work out every day. Um, just from a personal perspective, I, I, I think you, you, you want to have a clear mind. You have to have a kind of a clear body. And um, I work out every single day um, you know, and uh, try to eat healthy and, um, and just, you know, surround yourself with good people who, you know, you know, most people don't, you know, ha- I don't surround myself with just, you know, people doing what I'm doing. Most people don't run companies that are, you know, kind of at the bleeding edge of a new technology. And, um, and I think it's healthy to have a mix in your life. Jason, if you could go back and change one thing in your career, what would that be? There were times in my career where I lost the uh, humility and bought into the, the hype. And I think particularly during some of the, the fab rocket ship years of, uh, you know, in 2012, especially, I think you know, we went from, uh, you know, doing about 18 million in, in sales the year before to 120 million. And, um, you know, we, we had, you know, everyone telling us just, you know, how this was, you know, how great we were. And we, we let it, we let some of it go to our heads and that's something I vowed to never do again. And we have to earn it every single day and then every single week and every single month. I believe in what we're doing, but we have to earn it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, Jason, what's in the future for you and OST in the next few years? Well, I, you know, 2019 is we want to bring, uh, you know, a lot of these clients to market and um, some things we do will work and some things won't and learn from the ones that do lean into them and, and you know, kind of uh, focus on those and then try to adapt from the ones that are not working and, you know, build out the client base, build out the product stack and technology even further. Um, I see this as, you know, people ask me, how long do I think that I'll be you know, kind of working on a running OST? And, you know, I say this is this is a 10 year plus uh, journey and we're at the very beginning of a cycle. And if I look at the companies that I admire most today, I'd say I put like Amazon on the top of the list. And I'm no Jeff Bezos. He's a lot smarter than me and a lot more successful than I think I'll ever be. But I mean, he's been running that company since 1994. <laughs> and you know that that's a commitment mm-hmm. um i hope to be able to have the you know that kind of uh, opportunity cool jason this was fantastic many thanks for taking time thank you cheers thanks so much for joining us today more info on our guests and our sponsors is in the show notes of this episode and on the podcast website theblockchainandus.com to help people find this podcast, it's important that you download, subscribe, and give it a top rating and review on iTunes or on the podcast platform of your choice. I'm Manuel Staggers, and I thank you very much for listening.